If you don't know me, my name's Rob, uh, one of the leaders here in the church, and it's my privilege to, to share the word with you this morning, continuing with the series that we've been going through from the, the book of Genesis. And last week, um, Benson took us through the account of Noah and the flood from chapters 6 to 9. And we, we, know, we observed last week how God saw the extent of human wickedness in mankind. Everything that man thought or imagined uh, was towards evil. And um, we read one of what is possibly one of the saddest verses in the Bible, where it says that the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. And, um, but despite the way that the Lord was feeling about man, he did not give up on man. Because Noah found favor in the eyes of God. And so God found a way to save mankind through Noah. And so we saw that last week. This week we're going to continue looking at the outworking of God's grace to humankind. And, even, and we'll see that even though every imagination and thought of man is towards evil, that God is continually working in mankind to accomplish his mission, his redemptive purpose for us. So we're going to look at uh, Genesis 10. Uh, when Moses wrote Genesis, he divided the book up into sections. And if you look at Genesis today, there's 50 chapters. Those are not the 50 chapters that Moses put into the book. They were added much later. Moses divided the book into sections, and each section he gave a heading with the words, these are the generations of... And so last week, we looked at the section that dealt with these are the generations of Noah. And then this week, we're going to look at the next section, which says these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And this section starts in chapter 10, verse 1, and goes through to chapter 11, verse 9. I'm going to mainly look at chapter 10 today, which deals with the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And God willing, next week we will look at the Tower of Babel story. When you look at chapter 10, on first appearance, it's a very boring chapter. When I saw that I had to preach on this chapter, I thought, how do I preach on Genesis 10? It, com it's, it comprises mainly a genealogy. In fact, about one-third of the words in chapter 10 are names, names of people, names of nations, names of places. However, it's part of God's word. And since it's part of God's word, he has a reason and a purpose for including it in his word. Paul reminds us too that all scripture is breathed out by God and is pro uh, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so Genesis 10 was breathed out by God. And as we go through this chapter, we can expect God to equip us for every good work. Jesus also, when, after his resurrection, when he was walking on the road to Emmaus, he spoke to the two disciples that were, were on their way there. And he said to them, everything written by Moses points to me. So as we look at Genesis 10, we need to look out for those things in the chapter that point to Jesus. So let's read this chapter together, Genesis chapter 10. And on the outset, I apologize for pronunciation of names. Um, they are very foreign names, um, but hopefully I can make them interesting. <laughs> so let's read Genesis 10 together. Starting from verse 1. These are the generations of the son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tyrus. The sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Tugama. The sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. From these the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans in their nations. The sons of Ham, Cush, Egypt, or Mitzrayim in some uh, versions, Put and Canaan. 
the sons of Cush, Seba, Havila, Sabta, Raama, Sabteka, the sons of Raama, Sheba, and Dedan. Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on earth to be a mighty man. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in the land of Shinar. From that land he went into Syria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth Ur, Kela, and Rezin, between Nineveh and Kela, that is the great city. Egypt fathered Ludim, Anamim, Lehabim, Naphtuhim, Pathrusim, Kasluhim, from whom the Philistines came, and Kaphtarim. Canaan fathered Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gugashites, the Hevites, the Archites, the Sinites, the Avadites, the Zemorites, and the Hamathites. I can see God's really speaking to you all this morning. <laughs> Afterwards, the clans of the Canaanites dispersed, and the territory of the Canaanites extended from Sidon in the direction of Gerar as far as Gaza, and in the direction of Sodom, Gomorrah, Admah, and Zeboam as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. To Shem also, the father of all the children of Eber, the elder brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem, Elam, Asher, Arpachshad, Lud, and Aram. The sons of Aram, Uz, Hul, Getha, and Mash. Arpachshad fathered Shelah, and Shelah fathered Eber. To Eber were, two, were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Joktan fathered Almudad, Shelef, Hazamaveth, Jera, Hadurim, Uzal, Dikla, Obel, Abimael, Sheba, Orpha, Havila, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. He had 13 sons. He took the commandment to be fruitful and multiply very seriously. The territory in which they lived extended from Mesha in the direction of Sepha to the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, by their clans, their languages, their lands, and their nations. These are the clans, clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations, and from these the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we just thank you for this God-breathed word that you've given us today to look at. And I pray that you would help us see beyond all the names to your purposes of what's happening in, in this chapter, Lord. Give us eyes and ears to understand and hear your word to us today. Illuminate this word by your Holy Spirit to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this chapter, Genesis 10, um, is uh, one of numerous genealogies that we find in the Bible. And most of the genealogies in the Bible deal with individuals. What's different about this genealogy that we've just read is that it's ethnographic. And really what that simply means is that it deals with nations rather than with individuals. We saw it divides up into three sections, with each section dealing with one of Noah's sons. And each section ends off with the words along the lines of the sons of so-and-so, by their languages, by their clans, by their lands, and by their nations. And although Shem is the oldest of Noah's sons, um, the order in which the genealogy is dealt with is inverted, and, the, and Shem is dealt with last. And there's a reason why the author deals with these genealogies in this order. He's building up to a climax from Japheth and Ham, who are the non-elected sons of Noah, to Shem, who's the elected son of Noah. Shem is elected by God to be the forefather of Abraham and ultimately the Messiah. He deals with um, Japheth first, and you'll see on the map, is the map coming up? Um, so Je he, all these red names along here, there, that block is where Canaan is, Israel, so Je Jephthah, 
the descendants were there all along, even as far as there. And so they were far away from Israel. They weren't going to have much dealings with Israel later. And so he deals with them first. Then he deals with Ham's descendants, which include Egypt and the Canaanites. So that block there, you can see all the ites there, and um, Egypt, which is over here. All these are to do with Ham. And he deals with them next, because even though Ham is the non-elected uh, son, his descendants will have ongoing encounters and tussles with Israel. And so he spends quite a bit of detail talking about Ham's lineage. And Ham's, Ham's descendants are to occupy the very land that will be promised to Israel as the promised land. And finally, he deals with the elected son Shem, and Shem's are all mainly sort of here in Arabia and to the east there. <clears throat> And, um, but what's surprising is the way he ends off with the, with, um, when he's looking at Shem's genealogy. He ends off with the two sons of Eber, Peleg and Joktan. And although Peleg is in the elected line, the author only deals with the descendants of Joktan who are in the non-elected line. The rest of this chapter is silent about Peleg and his elected line. And to pick up on the elected line of Peleg, we have to go to the next chapter which, and, and read past the Tower of Babel. And only then do we deal, does the author deal with the elected line of Peleg. So sandwiched between the non-elected line of Joktan and the elected line of Peleg, we get the story of the Tower of Babel. And there's a reason for this, as we will shortly see. But I want to focus on three things that we can learn from this word today and hopefully apply to our lives. There's a warning, there's a praise point, and there's a reminder. There's a warning for us not to pursue the wrong things in life. There's a praise point for God's faithfulness, and there's a reminder of God's mission, which we are all part of. So let's look firstly at this warning not to pursue the wrong things in, the life, in life. We saw that the power of Tower of Babel story is sandwiched between the, the non-elect line and the elect line. And the reason the author deals with it in that order is that the, um, the Tower of Babel, what, it, what happens there is a result of the choices of the non-elect lines of um, nations. It, it represents the, the fruit and culmination of wrong choices. As an example of someone who made wrong choices, um, we told about Nimrod, the mighty hunter Nimrod. And he tells us he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And you could interpret this in one of two ways. You could interpret it positively. In other words, Nimrod was some, a man of might and valor in the, in the eyes of God. But you could also interpret it negatively as that Nimrod was someone who flaunted his strength before God. And in my view, the way we should be interpreting it is negatively, that Nimrod was a man who was flaunting his strength before God. And the reason I say that, if you look at Nimrod, he was one of the men who, like the men who started building the Tower of Babel, he wanted to make a name for himself by building cities. Pastor Benson shared that scripture, unless the Lord builds his house, the labors build in vain. And Nimrod was one of those who built in vain. He didn't build with the Lord's help. He was ambitious. And after having built or conquered four cities, he wasn't content or satisfied. He wanted to build four more cities. Nimrod epitomizes the difference between the non-elect and the elect. The non-elect built cities for their own namesake. But the elect, such as Noah and Abraham, they build altars to the Lord for the sake of the Lord's name. And so we see in Genesis 8, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And in Genesis 12, Abraham built there an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. There's always a danger when you become preoccupied making a name for yourself rather than for God. And the reality is that if we left to our own devices, the intention of every man's heart is towards wickedness. 
and this will lead to destruction. It is only by the grace of God that we, even as Christians, are prevented from destroying ourselves. If we were left to our own devices, we would tend toward evil. But the Spirit of God in us protects us and keeps us and keeps pointing us to God. As I was preparing the sermon, I felt challenged and cautioned by the Holy Spirit. Not, and I, and I, I caution you with the same word against pursuing wrong things in life. We must be careful that we do not become like Nimrod who sought to make a name for himself by building cities. We too can build our own cities which are no more than idols. God wants us to be like Noah and Abraham not building cities but building altars to his name from where we can worship him. What does this look like in practice? Well, perhaps you're praying for, to God for a new job or maybe even in your existing job. It, your job, you get your job and it becomes an idol to you. You pour all your energies into that job and soon you begin to grow cold in your relationship with Jesus. Your job becomes all-consuming, taking up all your productive time and Jesus is relegated to the sidelines. You become too build, busy building a name for yourself in your career. And as you get bigger, Jesus gets smaller. Instead, what does God want us to do? God wants our jobs and our places of learning, our schools, to become altars of worship to him. He wants our jobs and places of learning to become places where we are a light for Jesus. Every act of kindness, compassion, truth, goodness, obedience, integrity that you display in your workplace or in your school is a building block on the altar to God through which we worship him. The same can apply to other areas of our lives. Maybe you're single and trusting God for a husband and wife. Oh, if only I could find that right woman. And you see someone beautiful and you fall in love with her and you want to say, yeah, Lord, give me her as my wife and then we will go and be missionaries together and be in, uh, preach in your name. And you get married and you start spending time together and less time at church. And before you know it, you don't come to church anymore. And before you know it, when you leave Jesus out of your marriage, you, your marriage falls apart. Maybe you're childless and trusting God for a child. Maybe you need a new car or a new house, and maybe you do need them. And you're trusting God for these things. And all these things, all these things can be good and a blessing from God. However, you must guard against them becoming idols in your lives. We must be careful that we do not worship the gift rather than the giver. I always find it sad when someone has been praying and trusting for God for something, and then they get it. And before, not long, you don't see them in church anymore. Their lives become too busy, and their relationship with Jesus and his family take a back seat. Folks in your job or in your school don't build a city or an idol for your name. Rather, build an altar for God. That your workplace may be a place from which you can worship him and bring glory to him. God wants you to do well in your jobs, and he wants your jobs to succeed, but so that they can be an altar to him. Don't build a city or idol for your name in your family or in your sport or in your recreation, or in your social circles. Rather, in all these areas, build an altar to God from which you can worship him. So we see this passage contains the warning that we do not be like Nimrod, pursuing the wrong things. But this passage also speaks to us of the faithfulness of God. We see in this passage how God is faithful to his covenant. God made a covenant with Noah whereby he promised, I will never again curse the ground because of man. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. 
And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The map of the table of nations in Genesis 10 is a clear demonstration that God kept his promise of blessing to Noah and his sons as they were fruitful and multiplied and filled the earth. It shows us that God cares about families and fulfills his promises. It shows us that God is the creator of all peoples. All the families of the world are under the eye of God. The world is not out of control. God's covenant with Noah is an everlasting covenant with the whole world, with both the elect and the non-elect. Every nation listed there in that table of nations is a demonstration that God keeps his covenant with the entire world. And even today, we continue to see the demonstration of God keeping his covenant that he made with Noah. The fact that it's winter at the moment and it's cold this morning is a, and that we had night last night, that we have day now, is a reminder to us that God keeps his covenant with Noah. Remember, the next time you complain that it's too hot or too cold or too rainy, you're complaining that God is keeping his covenant. Our text for today also shows not only the faithfulness of God to keeping his covenant with Noah, but his faithfulness towards his redemptive purposes. In the garden of Adam, in the garden of, uh, guess, in the garden, Eden, thank you. In the garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God promised a future seed who would crush the head of Satan. The table of nations shows us that God kept his promise of a future seed through the line of Shem. And even though the table of nations culminates in man's sin as demonstrated in the Tower of Babel, God's grace once again supersedes human sin. This is because instead of the genealogies ending with the Tower, Shem's Genealogical record is presented a second time after the tower incident. And the second genealogical record, we see it culminating in an obedient Abraham who was to be a blessing to all the nations. It's through, it's through one of Abraham's descendants that all the nations of the earth are blessed. This happened with the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and me, who paid for our sins, and who made it possible for us to have an everlasting relationship with God the Father. Jesus came so that our status would change from non-elect to elect. God's commitment and faithfulness to his redemptive purposes for mankind leads me to the final point that I want to highlight from today's text. And that is that this text is a reminder to us of the mission of God. The table of nations reminds us that God is the creator of all people, not just his chosen people, Israel. Throughout throughout history, and even today, the people who follow God are in the minority. But that doesn't mean that God is not interested in the majority. His redemptive purposes are for all people And all nations. In Genesis 10, there are 70 nations that are mentioned. And the number 70 in the Bible is representative of fullness and completeness. So these 70 nations symbolize the completeness of the world. They represent all the nations of the world. And since they represent all the nations of the world, these nations anticipate the promise to Abraham that will follow in Genesis 12, where God promises Abraham that in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. If these 70 nations represent all the families of the earth, then it is these nations that we read about that are to be the recipients of the blessings that will come through Abraham. In some ways, that map that we saw of the 70 nations, it's a picture of God's concern for all the nations. God is saying, these are the nations of the world 
the, the nations that I created, the nations that I love, the nations for whom I'm concerned. And how does God, what's the solution to God's concern for these nations? He calls a man by the name of Abraham and he promises to bless him and make his name great so that he and his descendants can be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Abraham became the forefather of the nation of Israel. And Israel were to be bearers or carriers of this blessing, this promised blessing to the nations by being a light to the nations. Isaiah speaks of this calling of Israel where he says, I will also make you, that is Israel, a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. With the coming of the new covenant, the task of being a light to the nations has been passed on to a new nation. The one that Peter calls, this new nation that Peter calls a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. As Christians, we are part of this new nation, this holy nation. And why have we been called? What is, what is our, 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 our commission as being part of this holy nation? to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The table of nations comprises largely of the non-elected people of God, but it's a reminder that the majority of the people, majority of people even today reject God. But this also reminds us that the harvest field is plentiful. And God's will is that everyone should move from the non-elect to the elect. Paul exhorts us in 1 Timothy, he says, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. And listen to this. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is God's will that all people will be saved. For there is one God and there's one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. Which is the testimony given at the proper time. Brothers and sisters, the table of nations is a reminder to us that there is a world that is living without God. God's desire is for each one of us to join him in his mission by proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. I'm going to conclude. Could the musicians um, come up um, just as, as they come up? I just want to recap on these three points that I, I, we looked at today. Firstly, that we saw that, the ta- that this chapter is a warning to us not to pursue our own agendas. We must stop trying to build our own cities and, and, um, that bring glory to ourselves and rather to build altars to God. We must stop building up our reputation, our happiness, our fulfillment, the things that bring glory to our name. Rather, let us build altars to God that bring glory to his name. So that everything we do in life is a a place from which we worship God. And the wonderful thing is, is that as we seek first to establish the name of God in our lives, all these other things will be added to us. As we look at the table of nations, let us lift our voice in praise and thank God for his faithfulness. Let us praise God that he keeps his covenant with Noah even to this day as evidenced by the fact that it's cold this morning and we have food on our table. Let us be thankful to God for his faithfulness in bringing the promised seed through the line of Shem so that today each one of us is able to participate in a new covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And finally, let's be reminded of God's mission that through us we can be a blessing to all the nations. Each one of you can be a blessing to nations. Let us pray and intercede for those that are still outside God's holy nation and ask how he wants to use us today to reach them.
So in today we've, today's message, we've been looking at the genealogy of Noah's sons. And the genealogy is a history of, or it's a, it's, it's a history of the past and present members of a family. In the Bible, we told about another genealogy in which is written the past and present members of God's family. This genealogy is called the book of life. The Bible tells us that everyone who's received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is written in this genealogical record into the family of God, into the book of life. Perhaps there's someone here today who does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You've never had a personal encounter with the risen Lord. And as far as you know, your name is not in this genealogical record that is the book of life. If so, I'd like to pray for you. Perhaps there's someone here who says, Rob, I've been coming to church for months, maybe for even years. But to be honest, I don't have the assurance, the confidence that my name is written in the book of life. If that's you, I'd like to pray for you too. And we're going to sing a closing song. And if you fall into either category, please feel free to come forward. We'd love to pray with you um, that you can get that assurance that your name is written in the book of life. And if there's anyone else with any prayer needs, whatever it may be, please feel free as we sing this closing song to come forward and, and myself or one of the leaders will pray with you. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you have, um, you have kept your promises, that you have kept the, the promise, you have kept the promise of a promised seed through the line of Noah, through the line of Shem, and right through to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the one who died to save us from our sins, to die, to, who died so that we can move from the non-elect to the elect people of God. And thank you that you desire for each one of us to know you and to have a personal relationship with you and have our names written in that genealogical record of the family of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on and pray. Oh